Welcome everybody to Catalyst Contemporary in Baltimore, Maryland. So we've got Jed Smalley, a painter extraordinaire with us today. Do you, well, I, you, okay. <laughs> We're gonna say you're extraordinary. Well, it's your job. That's my job, that's right. Okay, so maybe tell everybody a little bit about you yourself, your bio, and then we'll jump into the work. Okay, all right. Well, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, Nice of you to take a little time out on this beautiful Saturday to be here. Uh, my background is a little diverse. Maybe um, some folks would call it bipolar. Uh, I, I started out um, as a kid. I've always been interested in art. I've always painted and sculpted and uh, started out playing with mud and, and graduated to uh, more sophisticated materials, although mud has certain integrity as well. And um, I wound up going to art school. I went to Parsons School of Design in, in New York City. Um, that was a long time ago, uh, 70s. And, um, and then uh, went from there to uh, Yale to get uh, a Master of Fine Arts degree and, uh, and, and uh, stayed there for a couple of years. And then I went to uh, Xavier Forcad, Forcad Droll Gallery in New York, and, and uh, I showed there. Uh, for a short time, it, it didn't take me long to get very frustrated with the art world. And, um, and, and I, I guess I would use the word disgusted. <laughs> um, and then what happened? <laughs> <laughs> well, as, as a consequence, uh, I also got, I was young and, and kind of idealistic and, and might say altruistic. And so I went back to school, uh, got my pre-med courses done, and went to medical school up in Buffalo, New York, and, uh, and um, left the art scene, uh, left showing, left uh, galleries, left uh, the, the whole milieu of what you're supposed to do to be an artist in New York, um, and, and, and was satisfied to be doing something that I thought was important. I, I, didn't believe art really mattered that much at that point, and, um, and, and went into medicine. But th the interesting thing is that I continued uh, to paint and sculpt for myself uh, in privacy uh, the entire time I was practicing medicine. And um, <clears throat> late in my career uh, in medicine, I started to get back interested into the notion of uh, being involved in... Um, in having people see my art and, and showing it. And uh, around the time of an early retirement from medicine, uh, I started uh, spending all of my time um, painting and sculpting. And I got, I was extremely fortunate to run into uh, Julie and Brian Miller and, um, and found what they're doing here in Baltimore to be really just an extraordinary thing. They're, uh, Part of what I see is as an important movement to revivifying uh, an interest and, and a passion for art uh, that belongs here in Baltimore. Um, and, and we got together and, and they very, uh, very graciously uh, offered me an opportunity to show my work. And so this is my second show in this gallery. I love the space. I love the people I work with here, Anne included, and uh, Liz. And, uh, and it, it's been a great experience. That brings us up to current to now, in terms right. of my bio. Well, and the, the first show was a little more than a, what, a year and a half ago, I, I think. I think so. It was right? just the beginning of COVID. What, what would you say has changed between now and then for you and your artistic production? Yeah. Um, oh, I think uh, that I'm always sort of exploring with, uh, with different techniques of make, making paint work for itself. Oh. Um, <laughs> the, 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 what, the paintings I was doing before, I had, I call them blobs, I guess there were areas of paint that were congealing to create a landscape. They were similar to these, they were very different when seen up close and seen from a distance. The, uh, each area of paint when put on the canvas, informed where the next one should go. So in a way, the paintings were in the process of leading and directing me as to where the paintings wanted to go. 
I, I didn't so much start out with a, a pre-prepared idea of the composition and, and how the painting should look. I just had an idea of, of an area of landscape that I was interested in. There was something about it that struck me. I did my studies and I got to work in the studio. And uh, I, I painted um, on the floor. Canvases were put on, on, on the ground and um, I used long sticks with brushes and, uh, and I would dribble the paint and blob the paint and let the paint sort of move the way it wanted to. I use uh, latex paint in gallon cans. And I have the studios, there are hun literally hundreds of those because I get them at the uh, Home Depot for cheap. Uh, people get You colors. get the cast-offs? Yeah, I get the cast -offs. They, they call them oop, <laughs> the oops pile. The oops pile. Yeah. And they, uh, people get a color mixed up and they bring it, they bring it back and they say, this isn't going to work. And so I get them for $8 a gallon and then I can mix all those colors. I'm always on the lookout for primaries. Those are hard to find. But anyway, um, what's changed is that the the... the I guess all of the intentions are still there, but I was, I just, I've discovered that working with a stick and a brush and the dribble and gravity, and I have step ladders and I get different distances between myself and the, and the landing surface. Uh, there's more, there's more dribble going on. There's more of the gesture of letting the thing flow as opposed to letting it spread. And uh, there's also probably a little more experimentation. I really find that there's a, a phase that I get into where um, these things create themselves. I'm just answering what the painting is asking me to do. The painting says, I you need to put orange here and it needs to be a real thin dribble. It needs to wrap around and then I'm gonna tell you what you're gonna do next. Really? Yeah. Uh-huh. And you know, it, it might be it might be I should be on some kind of um, of medicine, <laughs> <laughs> but the paintings do talk to me. They do. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you've been holding out on me. I didn't know. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, your comfortable spot is the uncomfortable place between your control and the painting's control. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. it's it's a tipping point. Yeah, and and I also think. That if I'm not, I mean, I used to be very controlled when I, before I went into medicine, I, I would do very large outdoor sculptures and large paintings. And I knew exactly, I had models, I had blueprints, I had it all planned out and there were fabricators involved and there were all sorts of planning involved and those things were structured. Now, I find that for me personally, to paint the way I do today and, to, and the sculptures too are, are, they sort of happen that if I let that process happen and I don't control it and I don't predict it and I don't pre-plan it and blueprint it, that if I let the painting tell me where it wants to be, that I think it's, it's more revealing of my subconscious. I think it's tapping into something that, I can only, that can only be gotten at through that kind of a process for me. Does that necessarily feel to you as though maturity has something to do with it? Like at 35, could you see yourself letting go in this manner? No. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I think, you know, today's art scene, I mean, I, I was told when I was in art school, if by 30 you haven't hit the cover of art forum, you're not gonna. Go to med school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think that um, for for this artist, uh, being older is uh, is important. So, because of your background in medicine and science, obviously, how how do you feel like that's informing the work, or does it? Yeah, I I, I do think that uh, science, and um, I don't know about medicine so much. For a while, I was playing with making images with pieces of X-rays. Because there's a real beauty to that, that big sheet of. You don't get those anymore, do you? No, you don't get those anymore. <laughs> it's all, they all go on digital. Yeah. So, but uh, but the the science aspect of things has uh, always influenced me. I I'm still fascinated by always was <clears throat> something that's been, I guess, consistent in my work since I was younger, was um, the uh, the uh, golden. Uh, Gold section, golden ratio, golden mean, yeah, divine mm -hmm. proportions, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That, that, it's that, a thing. Yeah, it's a thing. Mm -hmm. It's a real thing. Yep. 
And it's fascinating because you, the, to, what it is, is it's, it's based on the number five, which is one, the ratio of one to 1.618. And then there's a dozen numbers that follow that. But it, 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 and who would come up with that except nature? Nature. <laughs> right. And it's, it's amazing. It's, it, it, it exists throughout nature. It, it exists in the, the dimensions or portions of our, our fingers, the, the, the one the most distal digit to the, and, and it exists in the distance that the planets are from each other in their orbit, and it exists in the rings of a tree, and it exists in the curve of a wave. And um, the idea is that um, if, if, you, if you take a line and you divide it, such that the smaller portion of the divided line, the large portion of the divided line divided by the smaller portion is equal to the entire line divided by the larger portion. Everyone got that? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little easier in a diagram where you're cutting up a rectangle, I think, because I'm a visual person. <laughs> well, the other way of looking at it is uh, if, if you if take a, a progression, if, you, if, if the next number is the added, is, is the sum of the previous two numbers, so if you start with zero and you go to one, then your next number is going to be one. And if you take the next number, it, it's going to be one plus one is going to be two. So, so far, okay, one, two. And the next one is going to be three, but the next one is going to be five. And the one after that is going to be eight and so on. So what you're seeing is, is a gradual rise to a logarithmic curve. And you see this uh, you, you see this in, in French curves, and you see it in the curves you were just describing, you see it throughout nature. And there, uh, a guy, um, uh, Katsushika Hokusai, uh, you probably know him, Japanese uh, printmaker and painter. Uh, and, and he was around, I think, uh, I wrote it down here somewhere. He was around 1760. And he did uh, uh, the great wave off Kano Kanagawa. And the wave, now I don't know if he knew the math or he knew the, but the Greeks knew it. And this guy this, did this painting of a wave in the 1700s. And it's, it's perfect. And being humans and being part of nature, I think our eyes see that. We recognize it when we see it and we know it. I mean, I also think that you might recognize it, but I think for the rest of us, it's a sort of sense of order and just like, ah, that makes sense. Of rightness. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's a thing for sure. So I try to follow those principles. And, and that's just, I guess that's one example of how science sort of uh, has influenced and still continues to. Okay. How do you decide a painting is done? Uh, I, I can't do that. <laughs> if, we, it, if we put that on the floor, would you start working oh, on it? Oh, without it. And when I was here at the opening, I was looking at each one of them and going, <laughs> So I've got to get the studio. And there was one painting, and Julie probably remembers this. There was one painting that Brian had in the previous show, and I took it back to my gallery. And, I, and the way I paint is I have a painting or two paintings going on the studio floor, and I have this big barn I work in. You've been there. I have been big, there. Big space. It's a big barn. Really tall space above. And I have a lot of paintings that I'm not so sure about all up and looking at me and I'm looking at them. And I looked at this painting that was, was Brian's and it was in his, on his website and stuff. And I said, that thing's not right at all. And a lot of these I would go back at and I would add or, or change or, you know, but this one, I just, I, it, you can't find the old painting except Brian could. And he saw it online. I think I put it on Facebook or something like that. Brian, Brian, also <laughs> What is that? I said, well, it's a painting. He said, well, no, where did it come from? I said, well, I redid a painting. He said, you redid my painting. You can't, you can't do that. You, it, it, there are people that are looking at this painting that might, you know, we might, might want to buy it. Remember right? selling? Yes, yeah, selling. Hello. So anyway, uh, he, did finally, he did finally admit, maybe from Julie's prodding, that it was better. It was, it was, he did think it was better, didn't he? He conceded. He's just worried about the fact that he had the the image online that someone might say that I have to have and yeah. no longer yeah, exists. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. That's it's dodging a it's a you're dodging a bullet there. How do you, your color? I can't. I'm a print person, so I you know I always skewed at black and white because it's simpler, right? Your color sense is amazing to me. Like 
when I look at the individual colors on some of these, there's no way I would have picked up that gallon of paint at the store in the oops pile and said, I'm, I can use that color. But you always make it work. It's like a symphony. Thank you. Um, I, I don't have a color theory. You don't? Uh, no. I, I kind of, um, I mean, you know, the, other than the, the, the basics you learn in art school, but uh, I, I, do, I do reference landscape and nature for my color sense. Now, you know, some folks would think you, you look at a woods and it's, it's all green. Well, there's, there's green there, but there's every other color as well. And the interesting thing to me is I, I looked at um, equestrian art for a while and there are some painters that do horses. And you get a bay horse or a brown horse or whatever, you know, a gray horse. And you think, okay, there are browns. In. There are some artists uh, like Voss and uh, like Stubbs. And, uh, and uh, they, they, uh, they're pinks. They put pinks in there in the coat. And they put oranges and, and stuff. And when you step away and you look at it, it just it looks right. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it looks more alive. And it... It looks better than if uh, than a limited palette. I I find the same thing is true of landscapes. I mean, I know that there are pinks and purples and reds in 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 a forest, plenty of them. So I guess that if I had a color theory, I, I guess it would be um, I'm always looking. At use them all. Use them all. <laughs> well, you can't use them all. No, either, you can't. But, but so you I, have a theory. You just I, don't. I, yeah, I just don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I you know, I, I'm always looking, and and different times of day and different lighting, and shadowing and stuff. I'm always looking at the woods and finding colors in there that surprise me a little bit. I'm always amazed looking at, at paintings from across time. Mm -hmm. I always look at the shadows and see what colors the artists have used to make the shadows work. And it's never gray or whatever. I sort of think shadows should be. It's always blue or purple. Yeah, or, sure. Yeah, it's kind of cool. So in the last show, there was, I believe, there was one work that had water and light reflected on it. But here we've got two, which I'm very attracted to because I just find reflections in rippling water to be fascinating. And when I see them, I stare at them thinking, how in the world could I paint that? But you get it. How'd you do it? Um, I think, I think uh, the, the way to the best describe it is, uh, I mean, I, I sit there and I do a lot of studies and whatnot. And then I start painting and drilling, but there's a lot of error early on. So there's a lot of painted over and painted over uh -huh. going on. Okay. And um, what I do, I describe the way I paint as something of a, a dance like thing. There's a rhythm that goes on when you stand over a canvas, and, and these aren't canvas, by the way, I say canvas, but they're, they're on plywood. Um, when you stand over the, uh, a work and, and you get into a rhythm, I find that I can, by looking at what I'm doing, I find that I can feel the way the water, I feel the way the paint should arrange itself to be water. It, That's it, amazing. Well, it, it's, there's a lot of trial and error in it too, <laughs> you know. But uh, I, I feel like foliage is more forgiving, but reflection on water is like, you have to get it, otherwise it doesn't work. Well, you know, it's funny you mention that because that painting, the water, I did the other one to the left of it earlier. And I, I did this, and then there's one in there that I did even earlier than that. And um, this one, the water came naturally and the leaves, the foliage was, was harder. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. And that's a painting that's kind of interesting because that, there's a lot of dribble in that painting and there's a lot of brush work in it too. It's like these are almost entirely dribble. There's a little right. brush here and there, but that one is a, is a combination of two. And this one is all brush work. I started out with this one thinking I was going to dribble over it. It was an underpainting for a dribble painting. And I got into it. I got this far and I thought, you know, I kind of like it just the way it is. Wait, hold on. Back up. Yeah. There's an underpainting under the dribbles. Mm -hmm. 
So you complete an entire composition and then you come back over and... And then I destroy it. Huh. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes the finished painting doesn't have anything to do with the underpainting. Oh, interesting. And some of them don't have underpainting. Some of them is, are just kind of, there's something under there. There's a primer under there. So I do block out areas on some of them. Like the, the more landscapey ones there, I, I, like with this one, I think, or is the one on the other end? No, it's the one on the other end. I block out areas. I block out some shadow and I block out some light. And, and I start with that. And then I start, you know, crimping in on it. Close. Which, which also reflects the what the viewer goes through as with the distance issue that we were talking about earlier. Like when you're up close, it's a blob of you know blue on white on purple over there, and then as you back up, at, you know maybe five feet, it starts to form, and then you know when you're twenty feet back, suddenly you're like on the side of the you know, bank of the river. Right. Yeah. Which is that's a I love that tension point when your eyes are like, goop, there it goes, you know. And and I like the play between. Uh, uh, representationalism and landscape uh, it, abstraction. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like, I, and I, I tend to almost like these things up close. I like them uh, being more abstract. I, but I have a connection to landscape that that I, I have to start somewhere and keep referencing back to landscape. And and Brian, uh, I think. Uh, Brian and Julie have a catalog with, the, with this gallery that's paint, uh, art that tells stories. And I love that. And Liz probably had something to do with that. I think I wrote your... <laughs> oh, you, you did a very... By the I way, your, your little synopsis... Is, I mean, I should be asking you the questions and you should no. talk about my... No, no. You, no, no. you have very good, a very good sense of what it is I'm trying oh, to do. Well, I try. But... Um, uh, and now I've sort of lost track. Oh, of sorry. All right. I'm going to I'm going to distract you by asking you about one of my favorite paintings by Monet, de La Crenière. Oh, yeah. okay. yeah, she sure. has the pronunciation. Yeah. I'm so sorry. The Met. Mm -hmm. Anyways, you guys, this is a painting at the Met. But the way he paints water is a lot like this yeah. bottom part here. And every time I go to the Met, I stop and I pay homage to it because I look at the water straight and they're just. <laughs> It's a very, it's a very beautiful painting, and it goes. Boom. And I, I look, I've looked at that painting a lot um, when I started getting interested in water, because that man knew well, water. Well, it's, it's a lesson in how to do that, yeah, right? And he, and he, I'm sure he did what I'm talking about. I'm sure he felt the water, and and if you look at his his water lily paintings and his uh, and and you know a lot of his uh, studies in, in in his ponds. Uh, uh, Mont, uh, Giverny. Giverny. Uh, the, the, a lot of that stuff uh, is it, it's extraordinarily felt. You know, he just uh, he he knew his subject matter. He, I mean, the, yeah, they talk about him losing his eyesight and all that, but I feel like he's got an intuition like you have about uh, so. listening to your inner, you know, self and your. Yeah, I think it's more than losing eyesight. Honestly, it's yeah. a theory though. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> what, a, what about other artists that you have taken into your heart and soul? Yeah, there, there's, um, it, it changes from time oh. to time. But, but um, presently, I, 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 because I'm into gesture and I'm into letting the paint be paint, I, I, uh, I love de Kooning. Uh, I like looking back at his, his, and particularly his later work. After the women's series, he did land, a lot of landscapes. And the way he did them is very different than the way I did. Big blocks of color, but the, there's a same, ge a similar gestural quality to to what he did. And um, uh, Jean Michel uh, Basquiat, uh, I think, is just a, a a walk a step away from de Kooning. Uh, he doesn't didn't do too much in the way of landscapes, but his his imagery. I'm not talking about his imagery so much as the way he paints, uh, the way he lets the paint just. I mean, it screams at you. You know, it's, there's really a, so much gesture in what he does. And um, I like Laerte Baldini, who is a fauvist, and he does landscapes, and they are just exquisite. The paint is a little more controlled than what I do, but his interest in color, you know, it's almost like a post-fauvist sort of rich. 
I mean, he he's, does what I'm talking about, seeing the colors. You would love his color. Okay. And he's We're probably, all going to look him up later. He's probably a guy with a the color theory. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, I like uh, uh, Ron Bladen was uh, a sculptor in the early 70s, and he did a lot of paintings, and his paintings weren't seen that much. He's deceased now, but his paintings are a lot of landscapes, and uh, the, the paint is... Um, it's layer upon layer and layer. I mean, it's, it's like he's sculpting the paint and the atmosphere and, and what he does, he, he, get, he gets a uh, real gesture and atmosphere and there's a, there's a discovery process going on in his canvases. Uh, so he, Judy Fath is a sculptor. Um, she arranges things in a room that all intermingle and they, uh, they to me, are landscape. And she wasn't sure if she was a painter or a sculptor. She's also a fantastic printmaker, just saying. And yes. her prints will be here at the Baltimore. Oh, no Finer. kidding. Yes, they will with Tandem Press. Oh. Just saying. If she's around, let me know. I'd love to see her again. I'm she not sure was, she'll be here, but. She was a friend. Oh, yeah? yeah. Oh, all right. Um, uh, so was Ron Bladen. Um, but he's, he's gone for, he died in the 80s. Uh, David Winter is a sculptor who, uh, in, I'd say in a similar vein of Judy Fath, um, he makes landscapes, but they're all, and I like them because they're, they're sculpture, but they're sort of painting. He, the landscapes are sort of broken apart and they're all, and I don't know if he'd call himself a landscaper, but I call him a land, I call him landscapes. And, and I think he's, he's very interesting. Uh, Hokusai, I mentioned mm. earlier. Uh, 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 Hiroshigi, Utagawa Hiroshigi. Yeah. Um, beautiful. The Japanese landscape. whip up prints. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're, they're really important guys to me. And then um, I, I'm more recently, I'm just infatuated with Chinese uh, landscapes. Oh. And I think they're among the best landscapes ever done. Huh. I mean, I, I think the world of Monet, but these guys, they just breathe these paintings on, onto uh, canvas. And, um, one one guy in particular, I'm trying to remember. Um, um, well, it was uh, generally the whole movement of the Northern Song period was uh, was about um, they, they 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 got real frustrated with a, it was a rough times in China, and they got frustrated with um, what was supposed to be human order and 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 or and organization wasn't there anymore. So they turned to landscape seeking order and huh. seeking um, sense and seeking something that, uh, that could earth their souls and give them tranquility and, and their landscapes. Uh, so they went to the mountains and, and, they, and they believed that uh, that landscape provided for them what turbulent times had taken away. And I turn to landscape in these turbulent times. And I, I think truthfully that landscape for me is important because we could be on the brink of losing it. Um, they, they predict that, you know, uh, a lot of the science, scientists' predictions, what's going on with global warming, they're estimating it have been um, conservative. And that by uh, 2050, we could be looking at uh, un irrevocable uh, change. Um, so I'm concerned about that. And I do think, you know, we live in times where we're, we're, we've got a lot of things we're concerned about I and mean, we're concerned about, um, you know, civil rights and we're concerned about Ukraine and, um, LGBT issues and they're all important. But, um, uh, I think that what's going on with our environment and global warming, uh, takes precedence because without addressing it and without doing something about it. None of that other stuff is going to be here to worry about. And, you know, I, the, the rate of, uh, you, you look at the rate of extinction. I mean, they're, they're, they're somewhere we have to have a baseline. The scientists have come up with a baseline. And the baseline is that one species uh, per uh, million per year is the base rate of extinction. And what they estimate is that at current rates, we're at 20 to 200. What? They don't know. 20 to 200 per million per year. 
<laughs> so we're at least 20 times where we should be and maybe as much as 200 times. And they can't even say exactly where in that range we are, but we're somewhere in there. Right. So if that's going on, we're going to reach a point where the only things left are, are humans and stink bugs. Maybe and, a cockroach or two. Well, I might be. And I don't know which is better. I have a feeling the stink bugs would, would be better taking our place because at least they won't, they won't contribute to the end of our planet. <laughs> Yeah, it, it makes all of the other things, that issues we're facing seem just like, as you say, nothing, it won't matter. Soon it won't matter. Yeah, we, they, they, do still, they do still estimate that if we do something, something pretty radical, we start getting it done. And, you know, part of the reason nothing has been done is because, of the, you know, I mean, oil, look at what oil has done to our world and our, 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 our situation um, politically and globally. Um, if you look at uh, political leaders around the world, and especially in this country, they're all, in the, they're all oil guys. So, you know, what can we expect except, uh, you know, where, what we've, the hole we've dug ourselves? Yeah. So until we get rid of uh, these oil guys and, and we get on with, uh, uh, you know, other sources of energy, and they're, they're, they're available, we, we can do it. We can do it. We just haven't. Because we've been told, you know, we need to drive the big oil. All right. So in summation, the landscapes really are about hope for the future or solace in the, the basic state of our integration in the rest of the world or where, where what's. You know, I stand on a ladder with a paintbrush and dribble paint. <laughs> <laughs> Let some poet come up with the, the, the meaning. But all I can say is... Uh, there was a, another artist, Su Shi, who was early song, and, and he insisted that, um, uh, that the, the generalized notion of landscapes wasn't about representation. It was about, it was, he painted landscapes because he believed they were, they, that the people should see them as an expression of themselves, not as something you would see if you walked out in the woods. And, and he, he, he came up with that, um, I think, in, in, 750 AD. So it, it's not a new idea uh, that art, art isn't about making pictures, you know, and um, it's not about illustration. I mean, although illustration is a, is a certainly a valid art, art form, but uh, these paintings aren't illustrative. And I don't know how to interpret what, what they say. Um, I just know that I, I'm drawn to the importance of landscape. Fair enough. All right. That's an excellent spot. You're the writer. I'll let you, I'll, <laughs> you figure it out. All right. We're, we're, I think we should wrap up unless you have another topic you want to hit and maybe let some folks ask a few questions. I used to be six feet tall. I'm about five, ten and a half now or something. Um, and, and I, my the length of my arms and the distance from the painting make gestures that manifest themselves in the paint with a certain degree those curves and the gestures and the swirls and stuff have a certain proportion that's based on my anatomy and based on how the paintings are made so to they these have to be big they have to be at least this size that that gesture can get in there and coordinate with other gestures and create a composition. So I just, I've tried to make my paintings smaller and I do watercolors a lot. And sometimes I used to take the watercolors and I would take pieces of blocks of paper and I'd say, I would reduce and I'd chop it down. I'd say, this is better, it's better, it's better. And I would be able to chop them down. And I tried chopping some of these down and it was a mistake. They, uh, they need to be the size they are. But also, conversely, they can't be too much bigger because you can't get to the center of the <laughs> plywood, good. right? That's a good point. Right. I could suspend myself, though, from <laughs> on some kind of a... Mission totally impossible. 